Mother Man. Hey dudes, Dennis Wilson. When you want to hear about Manson family, check it out on Murder Metal Man. Spreading faster than a case of the clap in a trailer court. Able to shatter eardrums within a 666 mile radius. A podcast more brutal than all the rest. It's Murder Metal Man! Well, hell yeah, here we are. Doing a two for today. Yeah, what the fuck's up? Second one. That's right. Second episode we're recorded tonight. We are at Horns High Studio yes. on a Tuesday. And we're doing a Patreon only episode for our supporters tonight. So, so if you hear this, thank you for yes, listening. Yes. Thank you very much. Now eventually eventually the Patreon episodes become available to the rest, but it's months later, sometimes oh, more. Yeah. So you guys listening to this now, we appreciate you very much for being a 666 Clubber. Hell yeah, we do. Oh, how's uh, how's everybody doing, Chris? You still hanging in over there? Still getting it, dude. Still here, still here. Hell yeah, you got your Murder Machine <laughs> clothing uh, hoodie on over there. Yep. Very cool. Yep. Joey, what do you got going on? I got. I also got Gorgie's fucking shirt, oh, too. Oh, nice. And this sweet fucking Morbid Angel beanie Cashman just be yeah. giving me badass beanies, bro. It's because nice. remember last time we did the episode and he said he was going to beat me up over my fucking beanie? <laughs> oh, yeah. You gave it to him? Because Chris was at the nation doing the podcast. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I fucking gave it to him this week. I didn't want to get beat up by my co-host. Yeah, right, right. But I'm rocking the, the Chicago Domination Fest fucking hoodie. Nice. Uh, he's fucking about to start dropping. Well, he's got all the fucking bands dropped for that, but it's going to be fucking pretty big this year. So. Oh, sweet. Excited. Sweet. Yeah, for sure. And then I'm sporting this Death Sound of Perseverance shirt yeah. from Portland Distro. Definitely cool. Uh, they do some exclusive Fuck and yeah. official Death merch on their website. So very, very cool. And I'm seeing it, but you guys obviously know if it's the official Death merch, the quality is dope. Yeah, really it's really good. good quality. Very, very good. Relapse makes them for them. All right, tonight we're going to be doing this special Patreon episode. So, again, if you're listening, you're in that 666 Club. And eventually, you know, it'll get out there. But you guys are hearing it first. Um, if you're not part of the club, then you can get, uh, you know, the episode description. There's a link. You can go to that now, patreon.com slash murder metal mayhem. It's only three bucks a month. But, guys, we've had a couple of Patreon supporters lately went above that. One did it for six dollars and sixty six cents. Hell yeah, which is cool. <laughs> and then uh, someone else from Australia did it for like four fifty. That's cool. Whatever. So that's really cool. So thank you. Uh, this is going to be a different format than our usual episodes, uh, since we're only talking about one subject right. and we're not doing metal or mayhem. But it's a bigger subject, so it's definitely going to take some time to go through this. Uh, no killer cage match. No karaoke. Just one topic for our Patreon supporters. Now, we like to do these bigger cases for these Patreon episodes, and this is... Super huge. Iconic. I mean, iconic in true crime and just American history, honestly. Um, kind of brought in that golden age of the serial killer, as Peter Vronsky Kind of, and cults. Yeah, cults, just the sensational, the, the media frenzy. And Chris, we're doing the Manson family yeah, tonight. Not not Charlie, not Charlie himself, but the right the family. Not just Charlie, yeah, because yeah, Charlie's not, yeah, obviously a big part a of it. Huge part of it, but it ain't but all just about Charlie. The whole family, the whole cult, the whole gang of crazy motherfuckers, gang gang, that did some really fucked up shit. Um, and yeah, Charles Manson was the head of this whole thing, and he spent like half his life uh, in prison at the time this happened. And, of course, he was in prison for a really long time after yeah. that. So, Chris, one thing that people don't realize is that Manson actually never killed anybody that we know of. He was just no. more of a petty criminal, but he had that charisma. I don't know what he had going for him other than a lot of good drugs, I guess. But yeah, I don't know. And he, he knew some people that other people would want to meet. Yeah, I mean, he was just really and good at talking. figuring out what you needed. Right. And, and manipulating being there, it. very manipulative. 
Now, Joey, what is it about the Manson family murders that just seems to captivate? I mean, still today, like you were just talking about on our pre-show meeting, um, you know, there's still stuff coming out about Manson today. You know, it's crazy. And I mean, it was huge when it happened. It was the end of the 60s. Uh, it was rich people, Hollywood linked, that were murdered. Right. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, big time shit that was popping out because of that. And then the reason, I think a huge reason why it fucking stayed alive as long as it did, A, Charles himself. The interviews and things he would do over the years were just fucking ridiculous. Dramatic oh, yeah. shit. Yeah, so just people out of were control. always just like, oh, what's this guy doing? What's this dude doing? But also like the Manson family, which we're going to talk about, and all of them, it was just something that people have been able to follow ever since then. And not, yeah, watching non-stop. their parole here is watching, right. you know, uh, and anything else, any interviews they gave or anything else that came out about them, like people would eat that shit up. Yeah, so. presidential assassination attempts. Exactly. I mean, it's some pretty crazy yeah. stuff. Now, I think a big part of this whole thing was portraying Manson as some sort of devil that made these young kids kill in such a violent and bloody way to kind of fit the narrative that the prosecutors are trying to show to the public so that, you know, the jury would see this. And, you know, it's impossible for these people to live in a bubble. So as big as this case was, you know damn well everybody on the jury knew about it. Oh, you know? yeah. You can't have yeah, a fucking jury course. that doesn't know Just about like O.J. or any yeah, of these big the, trials. You're never going to find somebody that doesn't know about no. a case like that that's that big. No. So if they can get it out in the public that this guy's some maniac, satanic figure right. that's commanding these kids to kill. Now, did he influence them? Yeah, I think 100%. so. 100%. However, they definitely seem to want to go more on that whole mantra. Um, So Manson just fed into it because he acted all crazy, like you were saying, Chris. Anytime the media was around, he was saying all kinds of shit and making funny faces and crazy, you know, wild-eyed looks and all this other stuff. And to me, he's definitely a cult leader who is completely institutionalized <laughs> and unable to survive outside of prison without some help. So it was kind of like the perfect storm, like Joey and, you know, we've been saying, you know, the times, the late 60s, yeah. very <laughs> turbulent, race wars going on, Vietnam at its peak. I mean, it was Everybody's like a fever pitch. Everybody's everywhere. Yeah. yeah. It was a very, very, you know, perfect storm. And where uh, he's at, there's a lot of psychedelic drugs running around. Yeah, that doesn't help. There's a lot of people (laughs) looking for truth to a lot of things and and believing things because of their state of mind. Right. He was just, it was perfect time for him to get out for what happened, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it was all like everything lined up to make this what it became. Now, Manson gets out of prison in 1967. That was the year I was born. So putting this in perspective, (laughs) I'm going to be 55, Chris, in a couple weeks. Pretty crazy. Um, So that's how long ago this shit happened. Okay. Um, He told prison officials to not let him out because he didn't think he could make it on the outside. And he told them that he'd be back and he was going to be doing crimes probably worse it's, than what sent him to prison. It's fucked up. I've seen that shit before, though. I can't remember name off names off him, but like, oh yeah, really, like if you let me out, I'm gonna kill somebody again. They're like, oh, go ahead, you're good. Right. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I done told you. <laughs> right. Uh, he was existing as a beggar, and he winds up finding this woman in Berkeley, Mary Bruner. Poor Mary. Uh, He's so charismatic, he convinces her to let him bring other women into the house until eventually there are 18 other women (laughs) living in Mary's house. This had to be absolutely insane with that many people in an apartment. I can't even imagine it. That many females in an apartment. Oh, my God. Once all their cycles linked together, bro. All the estrogen, (laughs) yeah, the cycles fucking lining up. That would be really bad. (laughs) Um, I heard an interview with Manson, a Manson biographer, who said that when Manson was in grade school, he convinced a group of girls to beat up a boy he didn't like. And later, he would claim he was innocent and that they did it on their own, which is very strange. 
because that's exactly what he winds up doing later yeah, on. Yeah, convincing yeah. a bunch of people to do something yeah, for him. And yeah, and he claims, hey, I'm innocent. I didn't do it, you know, so... That is fucked up that he's learning the craft in grade school of how he was going to do this. Now, Chris, Mary was a librarian's assistant at the University of California there in Berkeley. So she couldn't have been making a whole lot of money, uh, you know, much money. How the hell is he convincing her of this, man? And like we said before, drugs, for one. Right. Everybody, I don't care if you're a library's assistant or not back then, then in California. You're smoking weed, which is whatever. You're fucking eating lots of acid. Maybe she just liked to, like, being a library's assistant had that stigma, and then everybody's coming in to party, and you're just like, oh, fuck. I'm having a great fucking time in life right now. Right. I love this shit. You guys right. can fucking chill. I'm cool with it. Yeah, like, she was smart, which is crazy. Right. He, he convinces her, even though she's a smart person. Uh, so it's not like these were all, like, these out-of-their-mind kids. I mean, these were smarter kids. That were showing up out here, and he is just fucking convincing him of this shit. Joey, I read that Manson learned how to play guitar in prison by old Alvin Creepy Carpus, <laughs> who was definitely one we talked about when we did uh, the Alcatraz yeah. episode. But how did he use that music in part of this whole shtick, man? I mean, music, he <clears throat> he learned how to play while he was in the joint, like you say. He's learned right. how to play guitar, so... He wasn't going to get out and go fucking get a job or do Fuck anything no, normal. You know he should have started a death metal band with Creepy Carpus, dude. That would have been badass. <laughs> but he's on the West Coast in the 60s. I mean, <laughs> music and art is everywhere at that time. So right. he's like, oh, well, I'm a fucking musician. I was yeah. playing guitar. So he uses that and he fucking, you know, sings song. He's, he was probably like a good freestyle rapper nowadays. Right. Right. Come up, I think most of the shit he did was on the kind of like, riffing, He wrote yeah. some stuff. But, right. But when yeah, he was just, just hanging out around with the girls and like, stuff, like campfire style, like yeah. he, he could intrigue them with his songs and they were understand what he's talking about in his music. And, right. <clears throat> you know, he's he was really big into like the Beatles and all that stuff. So he's listening to what they're talking about, about what's going on in the world then. And then he's singing that same shit, but putting his own twist on it. Right. So he's got these people there in front of him thinking that he's like some kind of amazing fucking person. Yeah. And he himself was fascinated by musicians, you know, the ones that were popular, you know, right. the ones that had yeah, succeeded, yeah. you know, he wanted to become that. It's kind of a driving force here. Now, one of the things you hear when you read up on Manson was that he may have learned some of his philosophy from that crazy-ass process church of the final judgment. If that doesn't sound like the cult of cults, <laughs> Dude, I don't know what that's else a does. Fucking culty name that's for brutal, real. man. That just sounds brutal. Um, we could easily do an episode on them. Very fascinating. But basically... They believe that Satan and Jesus would come together and judge humanity at the end of the world. Oh, yeah, get it. So Satan, pretty crazy shit. The homies getting back together. Yeah, Jesus and Satan are hanging out. Uh, definitely some crazy beliefs, but a guy like Manson, who had the street smarts and the gift of persuasion, was very, very impressionable on these young kids. Um, he would actually reenact the crucifixion while they were all on LSD. And he was careful. He would give them a full dose and he would only take a little bit. Micro dosing while everybody yeah. else is tripping balls. Yeah. And so this would make him seem more Christ like. Um, he would also use the name Manson and like the play on the Son of Man. And that yeah. whole thing, which was interesting. Ricky Cass, I was like, I'll give you guys a half a hit. I'm going to take 50. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> Pussies. <laughs> I'm the acid kid. Yeah. <laughs> um, the kids who flocked to the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco were all looking for something. And Manson was a master of finding their weaknesses and bringing them in. He combined a variety of tactics to come up with his own way of making believers out of these naive young people. Uh, Chris, he had him convinced he, they were the reincarnation of the original Christians and that the establishment were the Romans. So, Like I said, they were fucking high as shit. Right? God damn, dude. Yeah, and being hippies, they're like, fuck the government and everything, the establishment. Yeah. Like, so it fit into that whole we thing. We are uh, we're above you people because we're with 
God, basically. We're with Jesus, basically. So yeah, for sure. Like hell, yeah. This is life. This life kicks ass, dude. <laughs> Ain't got to pay for this house that somebody let us. That's crash right. At. That's right. Like, and got all these drugs. We be <laughs> fucking everywhere. Like, <laughs> Joey Manson gets old an old school bus and decks it out fucking dirty hippie style. What was the deal with that, man? Uh, he needed a ride to fucking get him and his fucking people because he was already starting to get followers by that point. Right. Uh, or just people that were hanging out with him that were not going to leave him. Leave him. Right. Yeah, They're not I, I don't want to say they were followers, of, but probably. But anyway, they get this fucking hippie bus and they fucking deck it out and drive it down to L.A., because he's thinking that he's got a better opportunity to get it in the recording studios and stuff in L.A. than he would in San Francisco. Right. Uh, I mean, legitimately, that is a, probably a fucking wise choice on his oh, part. Oh, sure. If For sure. he had been able to pursue that a little more. but Yeah, Slayer or Metallica, exactly. right? Metallica up in San Francisco, Slayer down in uh, L.A. I wouldn't be surprised, too. He probably had a... I mean, I don't know for sure the speculation, but I imagine he had some pretty good fucking drug connects down in L.A. too. Probably. So he got a little closer to that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if he didn't, he'd sure as fuck find it pretty oh, quick. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the summer of love, 1967. I was shitting myself in diapers. Fuck back yeah, then. dude. You still shit yourself. <laughs> <laughs> he decides to relocate. And so, yeah. So they're all down in L.A. Now, Mary, poor Mary Bruner, the lady who... Took his ass in when he was down and out. And let 18 other chicks move in. Yeah, she winds up getting pregnant by Manson and gives birth to a son in 1968 in some abandoned, condemned fucking house. So that had to be fucking special. Man, that's your fucking... and That's the best place to have a baby is a condemned house. I bet you there's heroin <laughs> needles all over the place. Right, like you gotta nice have, and clean. You gotta have toys for the kids when they're born, That's dude. true, Fuck. that's true. Uh, so she names him Valentine Michael, which is perfect. Was it born on Valentine's Day in a condemned band? Yeah, that, that I don't better. know. May very well could have been. <laughs> uh, I read that the actor, I thought this was fascinating. Al Lewis, the guy who played grandpa on the old monsters. He had a man. He had man to babysit for his kids and said he was a nice guy. So. Kind of so, funny how people just seem to I like the guy. I never heard that one until I was reading the notes. And I was like, holy shit, that's pretty classic. Because I'm a fucking, I love the monsters. Yeah, I love Al Lewis. Man. Like, literally, I'm fucking re-watching it. It's only two seasons, but it's like 50-some. But I'm watching all the fucking monsters right now. Again. Oh, cool. So cool. I saw that, and I was like, holy shit. That's yeah, funny. that's a trip. Yeah. But it was that, that was that 68, 67, or whatever it yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah, and Ed Gein, we talked about him, He's, babysitting yeah. kids. Yeah. They loved him, man. So Manson had all sorts of interesting and influential people that he met, as we've been talking about. I saw this Neil Young was very vocal about how much he liked Manson as a songwriter. Um, and he writes this song called Cease to Exist that gets renamed <laughs> Never Learn Not to Love, which is actually in the lyrics. Uh, and used by the Beach Boys, Chris. What the fuck with that? Hey, man? I guess they all want to be California girls. I guess. <laughs> so they totally shaft him. Dennis Wilson, we're going to get to him in a minute. Uh, we'll get to all that in a minute. Um, but Manson's using these girls to lure in musicians to get him to follow or them to follow him. Uh, the Universal Studios producer, Gary Stromberg, was very impressed with Charlie and, you know, how he preached, it, you know, against materialistic things, which obviously fit the time period. Yeah. Uh, he would say that Manson had a knack for finding out a person's weakness and using it to gain his own advantage. He yeah. actually took the Dale Carnegie sales classes, which are very high pressure type sales. Uh, my boss actually went through that whole Dale Carnegie program is months long it's very difficult to get through it uh, and it's like the master salesperson's course uh i'm assuming they still do it even though dale carnegie's been dead right. for years um but he learns how to get people what they wanted and convince them he could get it for them so that was the thing dale carnegie preached l ron hubbard another fucking master fucking cur- master manipulator with Scientology and how he also was able to get people to follow him. So he's studying the masters at this shit. 
And he also learns from those old convicts. Yeah, you, you learn know, those street. guys are pretty fucking smart, man. They've been around for a long time. Yeah, you have fucking, you got the street uh, education like we've talked about before, and then you got inside. You learn more about crime inside, so you, you're, right. you're like, what? This not is to where do. they fucked up. This is where right. He did good. Got to like, you got to do mix the two kinds of education around. Right. Right. Now, Chris, sounds like the typical stuff we talk about with these cult leaders like Jim Jones or Koresh, they have this gift of being so influential on other people. I don't know what it is about people like that that get that gift, too, like yeah. using it in the wrong way. I mean... Yeah, they could have done so much good with it. Yeah, you know? so much better. Like, Jim Jones could have... Like, all them people, he could have had doing awesome things, but it was all about him doing dope and fucking right. rolling, ro <laughs> ruling these people. Right. Like basically like he wanted to be a king fucking. Yeah. And of course I the thought. worst of them all, cause the 900 and no, something people yeah. fucking killed themselves. 992. I mean, mm -hmm. something like, so I don't know, but dude, yeah, a it, was fuck terrible. Ton. A fuck it was terrible. Terrible. Now, Joey, it's fascinating to learn about Manson's relationship. You were talking about this with Dennis Wilson, yeah, the bro. drummer of the Beach Boys. So Yeah, he fucking... What was the deal with that? Um, he had... Dennis Wilson was out fucking rolling around the beach and fucking... Ended he up is a Beach up, Boy. I mean, yeah, he was a Beach that's Boy. That's true. <laughs> but he ends up picking up two of the fucking Manson family girls, and they bring him back, and like they introduce him to Charlie, and he's fucking like drawn in by his charisma as well. Probably the fact, oh, wow, look at all these girls you got hanging out here. Exactly. And all these and shit. And fucking... He, you know, he ends up fucking letting him hang out and he fucking, uh, they go and take over his house. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know. We're like, going to talk more about that, but yeah, he, he lit. Yeah. The Manson family moved into Dennis Wilson of the beach boys house. That's right. Fucking That's so just, crazy. Dude. Yeah. Like, fuck you. We're taking yeah. over, but he was kind of into it because like you said, there was all those girls around. I wonder if Al Lewis ever partied over there. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that guy passed out by the pool? Oh, that's just Al Lewis. Yeah. That's Grandpa. Yeah, Grandpa. Uh, Dennis Wilson claimed all the writing credit for that song I mentioned earlier ceased to exist and would piss Manson the fuck off. I mean, who wouldn't be? He said, you made my song bop. <laughs> <laughs> Having the family taken over the house turns into be a little bit of a problem for old Dennis oh, Wilson. God. <laughs> Costed him more than a hundred thousand in damages to this rental home and for Chris medical bills to treat the women's gonorrhea. That's fucking gnarly, bro. <laughs> that is. Wow. That is so that it, there was that much gnarly. gonorrhea just, that it even gets dude, mentioned in the conversation. That's like straight up like That's a lot. When it, I got it from sitting on the toilet seat, man. Right. <laughs> like, for real. Yeah, Imagine, there's like, like the highs and lows of life. Like one time <laughs> I had to pay all this money for gonorrhea cleanup. This other time I was guest star on Full House. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of Bubbles on the Trailer Park Boys when with, the crabs, with the crabs. Yeah. And he flips the fuck out. I mean, that's just crazy. <laughs> yeah. That it's even brought up in the conversation with the repairing the home and the gonorrhea, and the gonorrhea bill. And, and that's I mean, a my God, it's that's gotta pretty be mentioned. Bad. God damn. You imagine the doctor like, Jesus Christ, what the fuck are you guys doing over there? <laughs> he's got a line of chicks. You just like... hose this fucking thing off every couple of days. It's what happened. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, um, my God. Just fucking disgusting. I don't see personal hygiene. They'll be into high on the, on no, the list of things no, to do. No. Not me. Must have stunk a just dirty ass in that fucking house. <laughs> Eventually, Dennis Wilson gets, he moves out because he yeah, can't he deal with it. he moves out first, right. And the landlord has to fucking evict him, so that yeah, had to God, be fucking Charlie special. Charlie and there's like, fuck it, we're squatting in this bitch. <laughs> right. We don't care, we're here. So that poor bastard, so they're probably there for months after until they eventually got him out. Um, but re Charlie records some songs with Dennis Wilson but is never able to get into the music business like he always dreamed that he would. But Dennis Wilson did introduce him to some very influential people in the music business. Pre-gonorrhea. 
pre gonorrhea. That's, that's where it. that's where he first met Terry Melcher too. That's right. Because Melcher was uh, he was a recording producer for the Beach Boys. Yes. He Charlie went into the studio. Melcher was also supposed to come out to the ranch later on. Right. And we'll talk about how that's like basically the set off point right. for Manson. But was that like the pre nation? That's pretty much the pre nation. I mean, like, would that be like the mega nation? <laughs> I'm just saying, Chris, was that like an inspiration? What the ranch? To the nation, yeah, yeah, the Spawn Ranch. I mean, just the wild yeah, party the going yeah. on. Somebody <laughs> lived in a shed on there. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude! I can guarantee somebody lived on a shed, lived in a shed on that motherfucker. Right, right. <laughs> August the sixty eighth, though, they move out to the old Spawn Ranch. This is an old movie set for westerns, uh, but all in disrepair. It's been neglected. The perfect place for these dirty fuckers to call home. Another tactic of cult leaders, Chris, removing the followers from society. And seclude them. Total seclusion, very remote place. Now, the owner, old George Spahn, he was almost blind and he's 80 years old. He lets them stay there in exchange for some chores and sex with the Manson women. I mean, come on, dude. Why not? I mean, he's 80 years old. Fuck it. He's almost blind. Can't do nothing. He's going to die anyway. Might as, hey, you might as well leave me this shit in your will, dude. Right? Like, so Manson... Guy, can these girls give me hand jobs left and right? <laughs> like, this shit is great. Uh, Manson learned from pimps in prison, so he uses sex to lure men to do what he wants. So again, learning from the people that he was with in prison out of prison, he's just very good at reading people and giving them what they want. Uh, the women, the women also acted as seeing eye dogs for old George, so let him around. That's kind of weird. That's good. They uh, probably just grabbed him by his pecker and drug him around. Probably. <laughs> uh, squeaky you from she said that shit too with the Manson family, like. Whenever they would have the meals, they would fucking serve dinner or whatever, and then the men would eat. The dogs would eat, and then the women could eat. So, oh, so wow. the women couldn't start eating until after the dogs were done. Oh, my God. Is that God. for real? I didn't see that. That's no. fucked, fucked up. up, right? Yeah, that is fucked up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is all going on now. Squeaky From apparently got her nickname because George would pinch her thighs and she would squeak. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's just classic. Uh, Chris, again, Charlie is showing how good he is to get people doing what he wants. And things now, though, starting to kind of escalate here. All right. He got I see how he got all fucking George to let him do what he's doing. That's easy oh, yeah. to see how that happened. Right. How he got talking these girls into doing that. Like, oh, this, I mean, that's pimping, though. Like you said, he learned from pimps. That's pimping. So that's right. how he got what he wants. Pimping ain't easy, but pimping's <laughs> easy. <laughs> So Joey old Charles Tex Watson joins the family about this time, not to be confused with Artex. No, not Artex. So not Tex. That's Wasn't that the name of the dog? Artex. Yeah, I was going to say with the horse and the never ending story. Yeah. Artex. <laughs> uh, but he would be a very important player in what's going to happen. Man, what's Tex's uh, story? How do he end up there? Uh, I mean, obviously he's from Texas, from the Dallas right. area. Uh, now he, uh, I mean, this kid grew up as good as you probably could have. Right. Um, he was the fucking youngest of three children. He grows up, like, adamantly attending church. Uh, he's really big into it. He's an honor student, editor on the school paper, captain wow. of the football team. Jesus. He set a state record for the high hurdles. And uh, so he's living life, right? Man. I mean, he's he's the Pretty what you would call back then the American, American child, boy. yeah. yeah. Uh, so then he goes to college up in Denton, Texas, and goes to the University of North Texas, where he becomes a member of the Pi Al Kappa Alpha fraternity. Now, through that, he meets one of his fraternity brothers, who is from Los Angeles. Okay. So uh, he, at the, he, at the time, he's working as a baggage handler at Braniff International, and he's getting airline tickets and shit, right? So he uses those to go visit one of his brothers out in L.A. Uh, and that's where he just he learns about the psychedelic scene, the music scene in the late 60s, ah, okay. all that stuff. So 
he's out there, and that's whenever uh, he ends up meeting some members of the Manson family who brought him, much like Dennis Wilson, back to meet Charlie. Charlie immediately liked Tex Watson. Right. Uh, Tex was probably pretty good at pulling in the females himself. Right. So Charlie saw that. But right. No, Tex was, as with a lot of the, the Manson family kids, they came from some of them some pretty good backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah, it's really sad how it ends up, you yeah. know. Now, the murders that uh, everyone knows about, uh, the, the famous part of this would be at the home of Sharon Tate, who was a very famous actress at the time. And she was, uh, I don't know if they were married. Well, yeah, they would have been married at the time to filmmaker Roman Polanski. Um, in a strange coincidence, the home was owned by that one person you named, Joey, Terry Melcher. Terry Melcher, yep. And Terry Melcher was the producer that met Charlie through Dennis Wilson. So he was familiar with this house at uh, 10050 Cello Drive or Cielo Drive. Cielo Drive. And that's why he fucking picked this place because he was like, Terry Melcher fucked me over. That's what he's right. thinking. Him and fucking Dennis Wilson. He, in his mind, he was fucking. That, that's all he's, he's pissed about the music thing. Yeah. Against those guys. Oh, yeah. So he was. So, like they say, they had dropped him off there one time. So he knew the house. Right. So he's thinking Terry Melcher's still living there. Right. So that's when I heard he No, actually, he knew Terry was not there, but he picked oh. the house because it was symbolic. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, but what you were talking about when he was shows up there was March of 69. He goes out there to have Terry hear these songs. And apparently Sharon Tate was out there doing a photo shoot. So he saw her out there. Right. Uh, Melcher later told him he liked the songs, but he wouldn't know what to do with him, quote, um, and told him that he wasn't interested and just kind of, you know, we're done here. And that is obviously this whole intense rejection, hating on him and wanting to, you know, dredge up all this negative shit because he had an awful childhood. You know, Charlie's lived in yeah. boys reformatories and oh, yeah, was- beaten and raped. I mean, really bad stuff that's happened to him that led up to this. And by this point, I'm sure he's starting to believe his own hype with everything he's preaching to the family, uh, to the girls and stuff. And. So in his mind, he had come up to the point that uh, he was going to get this record deal and his whole reasoning for getting this record deal, the biggest piece, uh, the the most important reason was because he had a message to get out. He felt that he had some information that he had to get out to the world to get shit going or change in a different direction, whatever it was. And he felt that he was being blocked out of that from getting this out so he's fucking pissed off and he's been telling his family the whole time like oh yeah this is what's going to get us you know whatever wealth and or the other shit the next steps and he fucking just flips the fuck out about it you know helter skelter here we go right right now chris i did not realize that he had been to the house before did you know that i seen a couple places that he had been there before but i didn't know why or anything i just know yeah I had just uh, always thought fucking... it was random, so I didn't realize that there was right. a history there. It's been a while since I've done much re- much research with this. Now, Joey, do you think? I mean, I mean, I can't see another ma- more major motivator than the fact that the house was where the guy that turned him down lived, yeah. and you know, it's just. There's got to be. I mean, that's an obvious connection, I think, for anybody because there was no other reason. Yeah. Um. There was, we kind of skipped past it, but there's a lot that's going on with the Manson and the Manson family, but there was another murder earlier on of Gary. Yeah, we get to that. Oh, okay. We get to that. Because so, they didn't think that was tied in at first. So that, like, that wasn't... Um, that wasn't a big rich motherfucker they were trying to go after right. at that time. That was a completely personal attack. Right. So that, you know, with those feelings going into this one, I definitely feel like Manson was more pushing for a personal reasons. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Now the common narrative about Manson and his influence on the family was that he convinced them that there was going to be this race war between the white race and the black race he said that the blacks were going to win the war, but would be unable to run things without the family's help. Uh, it was definitely the way the prosecution wanted to portray Manson 
because he was claiming that he saw, you know, the Beatles white album is the thing that foretold this. (laughs) So it's getting kind of wacky. And the song Helter Skelter specifically, among others, um, Manson convinced the family to believe that they needed to start the war by committing these horrific murders of white people and stuff written on the walls with blood like, quote, death to pigs. So it would look like the murderers were from like the Black Panthers. That's what they wanted people to think. So kind of setting the table here. So now we're, we're, we're when Sharon Tate's there, her husband, Roman Polanski, were renting this house. So the former owner, uh, the music producer, Terry Melcher, he's not there. Um, so he was shooting a movie, though, Roman Polanski, so he wasn't even home. I don't even think he was in the car. I think he was in Europe. He was. Yeah. So she is like eight months pregnant. She has a few friends over. Rod Sebring, who was a famous hairdresser in to Hollywood. The stars. To the stars. Yeah. To the stars. <laughs> uh, Abigail Folger, who is the heir to the Folger Coffee Company. We all know that. That'd be fucking great. How, how'd you get so rich? Um, coffee. That's right. <laughs> a lot of it. A lot of it. And then Wojtek Frokowski, he was an aspiring writer, and I think he was Abigail's boyfriend, or I don't know what his exact reason. Just chilling. Just chilling. Which, because of the fucked up Polish name, I think it's pronounced Wojtek. Oh, it might be. It's yeah. such a weird, like. It is uh, weird with the pronunciations. <laughs> Abigail's uh, boyfriend there, Wojtek or Wojtek, and this young poor bastard, Stephen Parent, who's there to sell a car stereo to his buddy, the groundskeeper, who slept through the whole fucking thing. But until they fucking dragged him in as a suspect. Yeah, right. <laughs> so talk about wrong place, wrong time for Stephen oh, Parent. Yeah, Steve Parent, that's the that's horrible. Probably one of the biggest tragedies of all. I mean, obviously a pregnant fucking woman. Yeah, but just such a fucking innocent fucking yeah. bystander here. That's like Texas, like, fuck you. Like, that's the first person he saw he got on property. And he's like, well, this is what we're doing. Yeah, so, killing fuck. everybody here. Yeah. Uh, Manson tells Tex to get a crew to go to Cielo Drive and kill everyone there and make it bloody. And he told them to leave a sign. He said something witchy. Witchy. So that's <laughs> what they wound up doing with the blood on the walls. So Chris... Manson knew that Melcher had moved out, but I think the symbolic nature of this definitely was a driving factor. But he also said that the house was kind of symbolic of wealth and it sat up on a hill. Yeah. So it was just a lot of symbolism. I think if he said that, he was just saying it to use as a kind of a scapegoat. He just did it because he was pissed off about the music. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. Because he knew the people there, like, he didn't just pick that house because it was rich and symbolic. It's people I knew and right. like did business with or what, biz, quote business or whatever with. He was just pissed off. Right. That's why he went there. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely a valid point. Um, Joey, this is a gruesome murder here on August 8th, 1969. Um, this is, you know, some of the most gruesome shit, really, that I could think of in the 20th century for you talking about serial killer or mass murders like this. Yeah, and this is, uh, I mean, another reason why this fucking has lived on is because they were fucking really brutal murders. And I don't know how early they were, but they had to be pretty early where you could start seeing the crime scene photos leaked, like even right. in the press back then. You know? Oh, yeah. So it's, as far as I know, it was one of the first cases where people could actually see the the damage that was done within the house. I mean, that's fucking scary. Um, that makes people start thinking, you know, like, holy shit. Yeah. Uh, not to mention, I mean, this is August of 1969. We literally just talked about the Zodiac. So he's got right. everybody already scared up in San Francisco. That's true. And then all of a sudden this fucking happens at a fucking very prestigious house in LA. Right. Like, holy fuck. Yeah. That's Something's just going fucking fear. crazy. Um, now, Tex was the leader with uh, of the group with Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Linda Kasabian. Uh, Manson told the girls to just do what Tex told them to do. Um, he's an hour away, though, at Spawn Ranch. Yeah, he's like, I ain't going to do that shit. I ain't shit, doing though. this shit. You guys go do it. Yeah. 
Uh, later, he would say that they did what they wanted to do, and he didn't tell them to kill anyone. Uh, Linda was the getaway driver because she was the only one with a driver's license. It's like the me of the nation. <laughs> right. Yeah, at the moment. Or yeah. that one roofer that can drive everybody around. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Stephen Parent, though, poor bastard. He shows up to fucking sell a car stereo. He winds up getting shot four times by Tex at the gate that goes into the property. So Jesus just awful. Christ. Uh, the screens are cut. They get in, and when they get in, this is kind of a famous quote that Tex tells Jay Sebring, I am the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's work. Now, what Rob Zombie movie do they use that in? It's a House of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah, yeah is that what it is? Yeah. yeah. I, I knew that he had used that, but that's where that comes from. Actually, it was fucking Devil's Rejects, but... Was, was it Devil's, Devil's Rejects? Rejects? Yeah, I couldn't remember which one. Fucking... I couldn't okay. remember which one of them. But it yes, was. no, definitely fucking he would big influence fucking by Manson. Oh yeah, so. big time. Uh, Tex winds up shooting Jay Sebring, so the hairdresser's the first one down. Um, they tie up Abigail Folger, but she winds up breaking free and runs away. She gets brutally stabbed big twenty time. Out eight on the times. Yeah. Sick and yeah, what the fuck, dude? Like not. Kill everybody. Yeah, and Patricia Krenwinkel was the one that did that. And some of the interviews I saw with her, I mean, just sitting there talking yeah. about it, like, you know, it was like taking the fucking trash to the curb, you know. Just, right. Yeah, I stabbed her 28 times. I'm pretty sure while they were stabbing Abigail Folger, like, finally she was like, just kill me. Like, as she was getting fucking pummeled. Like, just, yeah. right. like, just can you done. just, can you just, wow. like, end yeah. this? That's fucked up. Now, Votek, uh, he gets stabbed out on the lawn as well 51 times. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Uh, Susan Atkins stabbed the eight months pregnant Sharon Tate, even though she begs for her baby's life. Again, she is eight and a half months you pregnant. You can't tell she's not. There's no way you can. She fucking, no, she, was, she, I think she even went to like cut the baby out of me. Right. And take it. Right. If you're going to kill me, yeah. let the baby live. Yeah. 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 And she stabbed her in the stomach and yeah, it's fucked up. It's fucking bad, dude. I'm just yeah. not giving a shit about it. No, me. not at all. Uh, the groundskeeper, William Garrison, was there, but he was like a Cato Kalin. He slept in a little bungalow on the <laughs> right? property and he winds up sleeping through the whole thing. So good for him that he didn't wake up. And come out and see what the hell was going on. He's like, man, where the hell is my stereo at? Yeah, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> man, Steve, stereo. you fucked me, man. <laughs> oh, I needed that. I needed that 8-track player, man. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, really, really lucky guy that he winds up, you know, that like you said, Joey, they thought he was a suspect because he's the only one alive. Yeah, and it wasn't, I mean, he wasn't like fucking detained for a long time. Right no, there. they figured out pretty yeah, quick yeah, he was no. telling the truth. So Sharon's baby was a boy, and he stat died, of course, in the stabbing. So really bad. Chris, they start leaving some shit on the wall in blood. What yeah, was the deal with that? Pig on the door, yeah, fucking in blood, just like he said, right pig or something on the wall. But they just made a fucking mess of the place. Like, oh yeah, goddamn, no, nah, not fun. I wouldn't no. want to walk into it. No, and like Joey was saying, the pictures are brutal. I mean, you could see these scenes with the. <coughs> People with just a bloodbath in there. I mean, it was really, really bad. And even Charles Manson, like later when they do the next one, he was like, that first one was too messy. He's like, we can't do it like that again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joey, the satanic cult angle comes into this because Roman Polanski had just released Rosemary's Baby. And that, of course, has a lot of satanic satanic imagery and the media just went nuts yeah they're fucking you know there's people that were saying that he brought it on himself for creating something like that like you brought the devil out so you got what you deserve shit like that there was a lot of talk about how it was a wild cocaine orgy house and that right. they were always partying there and right i mean it's hard to tell you're a bunch of fucking young rich people yeah but they seemed like they were all pretty level-headed, and all of them said, you know, 
anybody that knew them or whatnot, they were like, that's not the kind of house that it was. Right. They didn't find a bunch of drugs in the house or anything like right. that. I, th- I think they did find maybe a little bit of cocaine. I mean, but it's fucking... Exactly. You know, Hollywood, Hollywood in the in 60s. In the 60s yeah. <laughs> right. So, anyway, it's not like they found a ton of drugs. There wasn't a bunch of shit. I mean, I don't think these people were as bad as some of the press was trying to make out. Right. And fucking, you know, uh, uh, what's his name? Fucking Polanski, you know, he's not even back in the country yet, and he's having to do fucking news fucking uh, broadcast. Right. You know, they're fucking coming up to him before he even gets out of the fucking country to come back to the U.S. So right. They're fucking, he's already hearing the accusations. Right. And he's having to fucking, like, set the record straight. Not even back here to fucking deal with the right. fact his fucking His wife's just been murdered and his, and his baby. Kid, kid yeah. and fucking yeah. dead. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's The, the media is pretty fucking brutal. So. They are. They are. Now, the family does not wait long. The next night, August 10th, 1969, they now hit a, a husband and wife. Of course, they're Italian, so go figure. Eh? <laughs> Lena and Rosemary LaBianca uh, are brutally stabbed to death in their home. They owned a grocery store chain, so they had some money. Uh, funny, though, with the Rosemary reference there. So we were just talking oh, about right, Rosemary's, Rosemary's baby. baby yeah. And I'm sure the media probably glommed on that, too. Right. Uh, Manson knew of this house from parties he attended next door. I was watching one interview with him where he says, yeah, that was my road dog that lived next door to him. And a bunch of <laughs> partying going on there. So another fucking nation fucking type situation. <laughs> and so Manson knew of the neighborhood because of his road dog living next door. Hey, dude. And so he saw the LaBiancas. He saw they had money. He also liked that house. It was also up on a hill. And he had that whole... Very symbolic with a lot of shit that he did. Um, But other than that, I don't know a specific reason why he targeted them. Other than it just kind of fit what he was looking for. So pretty, pretty crazy. But again, he gets Tex involved with this one. So Tex is again the number one guy on the net on the hit That's squad. That's his head of security for the fans. <laughs> yeah, it is. right, right. <laughs> um, now I also saw that fifteen to twenty minutes before this happened, Rosemary LaBianca had been crying reading the headlines of the Sharon Tate murder. That's fucked up. How do they know that? I wondered that too. There was a a Manson biographer that said it. So I don't know how they, maybe she called somebody and was upset about this and then it happened. Right. I maybe don't know. Maybe she had the periodical next to her. With tears they on just it. Assuming it. <laughs> People were like, oh yeah. Yeah, right. it's fucked up. So Manson gets Tex, Patricia Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten to murder the LaBiancas. Uh, this time Manson went with them and once they were inside, Manson assured them that it was only a robbery and that he wasn't going to hurt them. But he wound up going out to the car and he leaves Tex in there with Lena and Leslie uh, to uh, stab Rosemary in the back 16 fucking times. (laughs) Fucking horrible. And then they wrote the words uh, Helter Skelter on the wall in blood, but they spelled it wrong. I I know I meant Helter. Yeah, Helter. Helter. But uh, I listened to it again because you're doing that just because it's awesome. The interview, that podcast fucking Ear Hustle did with Leslie. Yeah. It's fucking really fucking good if you listen to her interview and shit. Like, she's been in there forever. Right. And she's supposed to be on, able to get on parole or go on the, to the parole board last November. Right. I don't know if anything happened with it, but she's been... The parole board has accepted her four times now, and the governor's overturned it all four times. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's fucked up. Uh, They also wrote death to pigs on the wall um, in blood, and they wanted the police again to think this was the Black Panthers. Right. So, Chris, now with this crime scene, the police are starting to catch hell from the public who are scared to death. Like Joey said... You got the fucking Zodiac up in San Francisco. This is going on. And oddly, they didn't connect the Tate murders and the LaBianca murders 
even though the cops that were investigating both crimes <laughs> were in the same office. Right. <laughs> How does that even happen? I, we just had a brutal stabbing here. And with a, messages on right, the with wall. messages on the wall. Yeah. How do you not fucking put that together? Like, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like, like yeah, it we're was working it... on this case here. It's got these people just got <laughs> stabbed to death all over the place. Uh, that has the nothing sh- to do with that. Yeah, yeah, that has nothing to do with our the case, next man. night. Like, I mean, that's on, fucked dude. up. That's fucked up. Uh, uh, that just seems to me to be a ridiculous oversight there. Now, Joey, the police really do seem to fuck this one up. I saw that the TV crew found the bloody clothes on the side of the road. Yeah. They interviewed the guy that found it, and he said all we did was we figured if we had done this murder, which way would we leave? And then they retraced the steps, and like 10 minutes later, they found a good place like to pull over, right. and the clothes were right there. <laughs> Simple I mean, shit. that's fucking crazy, you yeah, know? I mean, how ca- bad does that look? It- yeah, whenever you just got fucking people finding the most fucking vital pieces of evidence for your case. Right. right. They're just, like, just it, willy, willy yeah, nilly. I don't know. It was it was sloppily done. I mean, it was a sloppy fucking crime. It was sloppily handled. Right. Everything about it was tough. Maybe, I mean, maybe those cops just weren't equipped to, to deal with something on that level I don't at that know, time. Man. I don't know. It's hard to tell. It's but fucked up. They definitely did not do a good job. No. <laughs> Uh, we've been making fun of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Now we're nailing the uh, Los Angeles uh, Police Department here. Fuck. A 10-year-old boy found the gun that Tex used, so he threw it out of a car, and t- the boy <laughs> finds it. But he knew enough, I thought this was awesome, from watching TV to not touch it and, and goes to get his dad... And then when the cops got there, they're picking it up, and he's like telling Dude. them that they're wrong. <laughs> and he's 10. I mean, what the fuck? So they're like ruining all the fingerprints on it. The kid's like, what the hell are you doing? You know, Perry Mason says, you know, whatever right, cop, yeah, or whatever yeah. the fuck he was watching. Uh, then there was that Gary Hinman murder, like you had talked about, Joey. He was a musician in Malibu. Right. He was murdered right before the Tate murders, but the cops didn't put it together until later on. Manson was also there when Hinman was murdered, and there was also a message written on the walls with blood. So I just am baffled. Political piggy. Political yeah. piggy. How many murders and they all happened in Los in Angeles it? with blood messages right. on the walls? <laughs> right. I mean, I honestly, I'm blown away. You got to wait about 10 years and then fucking... Uh old Ramirez to start doing it again. Yeah, exactly. Um, at the Spawn Ranch, though, back at the Spawn Ranch, things are a little tense. I love this one. The police show up in helicopters and squad cars to arrest Charlie, so he For thinks stealing he's cars. fucking yeah, done. Yeah, because he's out there stealing cars the whole time anyway. Too. Yeah, but they thought that, or Charlie thought that they were coming there because of the murders. Yeah. And then they're like, no, like, we're here because you've been stealing cars. And he starts laughing at them yeah. because he's, like, relieved that that's all it is. I mean, they've been know? getting fucking cars, doom buggies. Fucking yeah, they oh, yeah. yeah. To go out to the desert and shit. Oh, yeah. So now that's even fucking the cops up more because on a technicality, the date on the warrant was wrong. So they had to let Manson and his family go. Oh, Another God fucking damn. just bumbling fucking idiots here charlie convinces the family now that they need to move out to the ranch to uh go out to death valley because they have to prepare now for the end of the world i can't remember if it was you know going back to gary hinman fucking murder i think that's the one they took his fucking uh maybe it wasn't his one of them though they took the fucking wallet went to a black neighborhood Oh. Hit it in a fucking public restroom so that he hoped some uh, African-American would find it, get caught with it, oh. and that would ignite the race. With oh, like, interesting. That's how he was trying to ignite That had to be it because I'm never I'm Yeah, not fucking just insane fucking thoughts from this dude. Right, right. 
So really crazy. Now, Chris, they're arming dune buggies. They're riding yeah. around in the desert like Mad Max going dude, that's on. What, that's exactly what it is. You're getting ready for that race race war, I guess. But yeah, dude, straight up Mad Max, uh, dune buggies, cars just out there ripping it, like <laughs> dust clouds everywhere. All LSD. Like, that had yeah, to be all real just sick. tripping balls. <laughs> now, I remember on last podcast, they talked about at that time before they go to the desert, when they're leaving Spawn Ranch, that Charlie was, they were trying to get Charlie to go back to Los Angeles, but he wanted to stay away from everything. Right. Get, to separate. keep them away. But they were trying to go back to LA. So he came up with this crazy race story and going out to the desert as a means to keep them with him. So they would leave him and go back to L.A. because well, he didn't want to go back there. And the desert, he's pulling from the Bible and from the Beatles. Right. And he was like, we're going to the bottomless pit. And what he's supposed to do is there's this fucking pit out in the desert somewhere, supposedly. And that's where he's going to take him and his family. And that's where they were going to go to hide. Right. While the race war occurred. So right. that after it was over, the they black come. people couldn't fucking figure shit out on their own and needed direction from Whitey, as he would say. Right. They would come up and be those people. Right. It's just fucking insane. It is fucked up. Yeah. It is fucked up. Um, well, you got the fucking... I mean, back then you got the Watts riot, all that shit going on. Somewhat <laughs> believable to somebody growing up in that time. Period, oh, sure. Possibly that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, very much. Now, Joey, the cops find them in the desert doing their, uh, their uh, <laughs> thing in an abandoned house. And what do they find under the kitchen sink, man? Uh, Charlie, he was there. They fucking raided the place. They fucking scooped everyone up. He was one of the last ones they found. But yeah, they fucking go into this fucking little cottage area thing. Had a sink with a fucking. Uh, <laughs> Did under- you see the interview the with the guy that found him? The cop that found no, him. I don't think so. He either. said he walked in the kitchen and he saw hair sticking oh, out, of, That's <laughs> out of the out of the cabin, yeah. and he opened it up, and Charlie comes out, and he's like, "Hi," yeah. <laughs> and he's like, "I'm Charles Manson," and he's like, "I know you are." <laughs> fucking cuffs his ass. So, yeah. And still at that time, though, they're not thinking they're getting picked up for the homicide. So. Probably not, no. So they bring in Charlie and 26 of the family, and they still, though, only think this is for the car right. stealing. The cops still don't realize that they've got their murderers there. It was Susan Atkins who fucking acts like an idiot in L.A. County Jail she does that stupid thing, Chris, that a lot of these criminals do. It's like talk to Start the celly. talking. Talking to the celly like, <laughs> man, they so dumb. Like They don't know they we don't did this. They don't even know what we did, man. We killed them motherfuckers. They got us on some petty shit compared to what we did. Right. The celly going to be like, uh, <laughs> oh, excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> I want an extra piece of pie at lunch, so here's this fucking. No, I want some time off my shit. <laughs> right, right, right. I got some evidence yeah, yeah i got some information you yeah, guys want to hear so this dude. brings the whole fucking thing down stupid susan atkins um and charlie gets named of course as the ringleader and he fed into this because he had this narcissistic view of himself so he's not doing himself any favors here <laughs> vincent bugliosi another italian just want to mention that uh lead, <laughs> lead prosecutor in a good in a good way finally uh, would use it to his advantage and blame the murders on Manson. So this is an absolute three-ring fucking circus, Chris. I mean, the Dang. Manson family is fucking protest protesting outside. They're fucking shaving their heads. They're putting fucking swastikas stickers on their foreheads. Did I they mean, fucking uh, come home? Got together try, trying to break them out. They went and robbed the fucking the gun store. Right. What was it? The gun store that they they could. But they got in a shootout with the cops and shit, and they all got fucking <laughs> caught, dude. Did wow. you see that? <laughs> no, I didn't see that. No? That's was, fucked up. Because while Manson was in jail, they were going to have a couple different ways they were thinking about how to fucking get him out of jail. And one of them was basically <laughs> just bum rush the fucking court fucking with guns and take him. Dude. Like, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> so they were carving X's into their foreheads. It was Charlie that did the swastika sticker later. later. On, yeah. It started out as an X. It started yeah. out with shaving their head and fucking putting an X on their head. Yeah. Because yeah. they were Xing themselves from society. Right, right. Um, and they're actually camped on the courthouse lawn. That had to be fucking special. 
And they're doing all Could kinds of interviews. Could you imagine the Madsen family hanging out in Hell front of no. a fucking... I would have been over there hanging out with them every day. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, y'all? <laughs> y'all ain't do no killings, right? <laughs> So this had to just be unbelievable, and it just showed that Manson had power over them, and that was, again, just feeding into that narrative that he was commanding them to kill. Uh, Manson was out of control in the courtroom. He jumps over the table with a pencil to attack the judge. Um, And then at the fucking (laughs) stupid, President Nixon said that Manson was guilty in a speech. Yeah, he almost fucked up. Yeah, because you you do that. Manson went crazy, said he should get a mistrial because the the president's out here saying I'm fucking guilty. guilty. Right. Yeah, come on, man. Yeah, that was pretty dumb. That's like we were talking about getting a jury anyway, but now you got the president. Right. Fucking, woo, goddamn. That does not look good for you, homie. No, not at all. (laughs) Uh, Bugliosi was able to pull it all together, that whole helter-skelter concept that Charlie was preaching about his obsession with the White Album and this race war, and wow. And Bugliosi goes on to write the book, Helter Skelter, he does. which is amazing. Yeah, it's very, very good. Very impressive, though, that he did pull that together. Um, but Linda Kasabian was key because she was that star witness to testify against Charles Manson. So that's what really blew it open. They probably would not have been successful without her testimony of how much influence that he he had had over her. Her and everybody else. Yeah. Now, what do you guys think about the whole idea of Charles Manson being convicted as a murderer, even though he didn't actually kill anybody? Chris, what do you think? Uh... I mean, I don't, that's hard, dude. Because he didn't really do anything. He said some words to people, and they're like, all right, cool. I'm going to go do that. Yeah, I mean, they were adults. It wasn't like they were children, you know. At the same time, I feel like even if he didn't get murder and he got time, he would have got out and did the same goddamn thing. Probably. So, I mean, I don't know, dude. Yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of torn on it, too, Joey. They should have just put him in a mental hospital, and they could have kept him there indefinitely. Yeah. I feel True. like, uh, I mean, they could have. <clears throat> Manson was a cult leader, and the fact is, is that almost any cult you see, the leader of that cult goes down with them. Charles Manson, he's at another disadvantage because he's already spent half his life in prison. Right. right. So this is another strike against shit that who knows? I mean, you know, he he might have been facing. A life sentence because he'd been gone twice and that was his third strike. I I don't yeah, know. I'm not sure so either. Right. That. That's and, true. And That's the, true. The other aspect of it is Charles Manson, while he's adamantly denying, I never killed anybody. So fuck y'all. You know, which rightly so. He's doing it in a way, and his actions, and he's so remorseless for any of the for any well, of it. So yeah. that's where he fucked himself too. Like, yeah, your fucking attitude, everything you're doing to you and your fucking friends here in the courtroom you're doing you're not something helping against case. the world but right. to everybody else they're looking at you like you fucking idiot so right I, I mean that's the reason why that dude is locked up and or you know was locked up and did what all the time he did yeah he may not have fucking physically stuck a knife in somebody but he was uh more than fucking complacent and helping out with the whole situation. Yeah. He fucking told them the addresses to go to. None of them had those addresses. Right. He and had, he went with them. Right. right. He told Bianca. them exactly. where to go. He went inside there. And so Hinman. Right. Who knows any other dirt they did while they were the family. Right. I mean, he could have killed a couple people. You never know. True. There's stories that there was another person, you know, that supposedly got killed. Right. Uh, that caused... Um, conflict between him and the black panthers which went on to fuel his race war theory i don't know charles manson's a very fucking odd very complicated character exactly. man so i'm on the fence to like to you put guys him in jail and just leave him in there i think was the best thing the society could have done probably yeah because so, i agree with chris he would have just gone out and done it again i mean i yeah, feel 100% like 100 would have gone out you and could have studied again. a person like ted bundy way more than you could have studied charles manson sure so that's sad that you would keep him alive and not somebody like Bundy. True. But then Bundy, on the other hand, is always fucking escaping and killing people. So goddamn, right. just get rid of him. Fuck right. Him. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Bundy didn't do himself any favors. 
All right. Uh, Manson told the girls who murdered to testify that they were responsible for the murders and he had nothing to do with it. He even had words with one of the women's attorneys telling him, quote, I don't want you to ever or I don't want to ever see you in this courtroom again. Ironically, the attorney was found months later crushed by a large rock. (laughs) That would suck. (laughs) Some people think the family might have had something Something to to do do with with that. Yeah. But he was so decomposed, (laughs) they were not able to even find a cause of death. But his widow said that there was a big rock that was on top of him, the body. So like just a huge fucking rock. So I'm guessing that that caused it. So was there was he in a place where there's rock slides? Shit. No, I think it was like the body was like he was taken out somewhere and they fucking hit him okay, over the yeah, head that, with a big rock. Tell me is I think what they went. You have to think that to be honest, to this day there's at least a, a handful of people that live in the world that consider themselves i guess manson followers yeah or were manson followers while he was alive and you know are still so to think that somebody could pull off something crazy like that it's yeah not inconceivable no <clears throat> when i was writing to richard ramirez that was one thing it was like okay who else can i write to and i was like man i'd love to write to one of the manson family like the girls were i was like but i'm never going to do that and the reason is because charles manson then he has my address who right. knows who the fuck he's got out here <laughs> right. that could just fucking come kill the shit out of me or something. Right. You know, like that was something really to think about. So I never wrote to nobody like that because I mean, people like that do have influence and power over people, even from the inside. Yeah. You never know, man. Do the Leslie in that interview that I was talking about, like somehow a letter from Manson got to her in her prison, like threatening her and shit. She's like, oh, wow. I fucking freaked out, like got from Manson to hers. So, Oh, wow. I saw an informant told the police that the lawyer was murdered by Manson's family, uh, but no charges were ever filed, and it still remains an unsolved case. Uh, Manson said that the district attorney killed him, so that's what Manson said. (laughs) Chris, no surprise that all four of the family that were tried were convicted. They all get a death sentence. I mean, there was some pretty brutal murder going on in there, like yeah. for real, like killing, stabbing the, the, fifty-one sp- times on the lawn. That's pretty stabbing weird. a pregnant woman and killing her and her unborn yeah. child. Yeah, like pretty rough, man. Pretty rough, and not even giving a shit about it. No, not at all. It's uh, but they bad. would get overturned. The 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 it's, death sentences would be commuted to life sentences. Right. Yeah, they they killed the death sentence for a minute, but yeah, they're like, yeah, they all got life sentences. Yeah. Now, Joey Manson and the three women continue to stay in the public eye. It goes on and on. Manson's face is on fucking everything. It's a cover of Rolling Stone. It was Man of the Year yeah. by some other fucking magazine. Yeah. I mean, what the fuck? It, it was, you know, their, high, their crimes are horrific. They got the sentences that they fucking deserve. But Charlie's still outspoken and very fucking odd, so people are fucking paying attention to what he's doing out of interest or curiosity or whatever. Yeah, and so the the media is going to pick up on that, right? As far as I know, I would have to think that Charles Manson's one of the first killers to start getting his face on a t shirt. I yeah. think you're probably yeah. right. So that's like lucrative and buttons and whatever else. Oh yeah. Then. But you got a time whenever fucking you know. He, be, he starts becoming a symbol because it's like, okay, what he did was horrible. He got sentenced for all that. Okay. But on the other side of it, if you look at it just as these fucking dirtbag kids who are fucking from the underneath of society right. rose up and fucking took back something from the overpowering fucking infrastructure. Right. You know, it, w- it was a class thing to some of these people. So they're oh, yeah. at them like, the fuck underdogs, yeah, you guys yeah. are like the Robin Hood of fucking, right. you know, the ghetto or whatever. Right. Yeah, no, you're right, dude. The poor killing the rich. Yeah, like know? those motherfuckers ate their fucking meals out of trash cans. And, you know, people were like, those. they were trying to make a difference. Yeah. And this is a way that they were trying to make a difference. And I understand that. And so that's why right. you had people fucking walk around with Charlie Manson shirts and all kinds of shit. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, know? exactly. Exactly. Um, now, it's amazing, though, the influence they had still. Now, Susan Atkins, she dies in prison from cancer. 
Susan Krenwinkel is the longest surviving inmate in uh, female inmate in California. Uh, Squeaky Fromm. Now, she didn't kill anybody, but she, <laughs> she tried, tried to assassinate <laughs> President Gerald Ford. I mean, he was a pretty chill dude. Like, yeah. what the fuck? She had an idea for that. Yeah, I don't know what the what the reason was with that. I think she got found out before it ever happened. Oh, is that what it was? Like, she was writing it down or maybe told. I don't know what the deal was, but I don't think the attempt ever happened. Oh, she okay. Did I get, thought she, like, actually tried to do it. But she did get popped for it. I oh, she did. Right. Yeah, yeah, she did. She was released from prison in 2009. Uh, Manson, of course, dies in Corcoran Prison in November of 2017. Uh, so that, you know, that's been now a few years. Um, and his artwork, though, in prison was sold through a former guest of ours, William Harder, at hmm. MurderCentral.com. Yeah. And William actually met Manson multiple times. Chris, we talked to him yeah, about that. Yeah, I remember that. talking to him about that. Yeah, so Said, William. Dude, fucking weird. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the media has gone crazy in this case, naming him Man of the Year, as I mentioned, Rolling Stone on the cover, and countless other things and books and movies, documentaries. Mu the I mean, music fucking on and on. Lot, lot of music fucking influenced by yeah, him, dude. a lot of stuff out there about him. I mean, really, this is one of the bigger cases. Anything to add to this, guys? No. I mean, we wanted to do the Manson family, not yeah. specific to Charlie, but I think we covered it pretty well. I got a, something I just want to bring up, especially since we're fucking Murder Metal Mayhem, you know? Of course. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, I was going to bring up a little bit more um, just about the house at... Uh, you know, 150 Cielo Drive. The house, <clears throat> after, of course, it's, you know, it's the fucking Manson family where they fucking killed, you know, Sharon Tate and all that. But the people who lived there, there was like a bunch of people who had rented that place, like big names. So Carrie Grant had lived there, Henry Fonda, uh, <clears throat> Olivia Hussey, who was in fucking Black Christmas, the original one, and in It. Um, just a lot of fucking pretty big people, you know what I'm saying? Interesting. Uh, now, so that how, you know, then Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate, they rent it too. But, um, later on, the last resident of that home was Trent Reznor from the Nine Inch Nails. Oh, for, wow. Uh, he rented it in 1992, set up his recording studio, which was dubbed Pig, uh, obviously a reference to right. what Susan oh, Atkins wow. wrote in Tate's Blood. Um, and they recorded the sessions for most of the Downward Spiral at that Which house. Has pig on it. And uh, they also recorded the Broken EP, and um, they did the video for Gave Up at that uh, residence. Huh. Marilyn Manson came in, and he recorded sections of Portrait of American Family there also, because obviously him and Trent Reznor were fucking buddies. Right. Um, one day... Uh, it was Sharon Tate's sister, I believe. She came up and saw Trent Reznor outside. <clears throat> she was like, are you trying to, you know, monetize off my sister's death? Or She came at him like that, and he was like, it kind of blew his mind, you know? And he was like, no, I was just trying to be in a messed up part of history, you know? Right. He said he explained it to her, but then later on he was like, man, what if that was my sister? I'd be like, yo, fuck Charles Manson. Right, right, right. And uh, he ended up fucking getting rid of the house. Now, he did remove um, the front door to it, and he installed it at his Nothing Studios in New Orleans, where, you know, which it's, is now still his, where he was. Right, shit. right. Oh, wow. And so that's, that, fucking... the, that's there, and then they ended up fucking destroying the house. But yeah, yeah. fucking Trent Reznor, he had it, and a couple pretty fucking iconic Yeah, albums that's pretty interesting. Came I out of that. Know that. Very cool. Um, I, I did get a little bit of metal in this motherfucker. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I used a few sources for what I learned. The 2020 special I watched called The Family Manson was actually very good. Lots of interviews. Uh, I mentioned last podcast on the left, they did a great multi-part on this uh, topic. That's where I learned about the whole Dennis Wilson thing. I had never known that before. Um, I've read and watched Helter Skelter many times. Um I've known about this for as long as I can remember because obviously this happened when I was a, a baby, but you know, my dad being in the parole officer business, my mom worked for a legal secretary and this was it's just not going at that time. Yeah. Right? I mean, it was, it was something I was very well aware of. I'd read the book 
probably the first true crime book I read would have probably been Helter Skelter. And I brought in fucking, I took a picture for our listeners, but I brought in a few of the movies I had. Yeah. But uh, I got a newer one, Charlie Says. And I think you can find this on streaming platforms. But the guy who did American Psycho did this. Uh, And it's really good. And it's based off of the fucking female uh, uh, Manson family. Interesting. Uh, and then I also got Helter Skelter. Uh, the old one with Steve Rails back. Oh, yeah, Sandy I love that, that one. one. And then I got the director's cut, Helter Skelter. This guy, Jeremy Davies, playing uh, Charlie Manson, which is awesome. And then I also got the Manson family, which was done by uh, Jim Van Jim Van Beber, who did My Sweet Satan and some of those. Yeah, but oh, yeah. Same dude really did. Yeah, Ricky Casso. Yeah, Ricky Casso. Yeah. Casso. Nice. Yeah, hell yeah. Nice. Ricky Casso, Chris, just keeps... Coming and back. Another one I'll say, too, if uh, anybody's out there is listening, but it's more of a, a documentary, and they go out to, like, the ranch. And it's pretty cool, but it's called uh, Manson, the Man That Killed the 60s, and that one's really good. If You, you could probably find that streaming, too. Huh. Interesting. Very cool. Well, that's the end of this very special Patreon episode. We want to thank you guys in the 666 yeah, once again, Club. Yeah, all you members, fucking thank you. We appreciate fucking- Yeah, and <clears throat> all of you guys, uh, we do appreciate it. And uh, if you're listening to this later on and you're not a 666 Club member, you can go to the episode description and do that. Because you and could have three been bucks a month. One. That's it. Yeah, you would have heard this months ago if you would have been a member of the club. Uh, Check out MurderMetalMayhem.com to listen to all the past episodes. And you can follow us on or like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to that YouTube channel. we got a lot of videos on there, and that's growing. Uh, So go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, We also, you know, just about every platform that's out there. So go and listen and like it, comment. It helps move us up and more people can hear us and it just helps the show out. So I thought, you know, we're not doing karaoke tonight, but I thought, why not bust out some of Charlie's music? This is the song that the Beach Boys stole from him. So that's <laughs> fucked up. After all, that's what Charlie really wanted to be, really, was just a musician. Now his so. music's out there forever. You know, that's the, right. And the fucking last connection I can make with this case real fast is the first time I ever had Gormonger put on a pro press cd yeah like not cdr or whatever right uh was my song gacy's last which is on a uh it was the company or the label is called serial killer um records or something like that <clears throat> but every song was about serial killer and i used one of my songs but they also had charles manson song on there oh cool uh lou rusconi did all the artwork for oh it. nice yeah like, it's really fucking sweet cd but yeah i was like my first pro press fucking release and charles manson song you know there you go sweet. there you go oh, yeah dude all right well until next time keep one foot in the gutter and keep your knife out of a pregnant woman's stomach <laughs> <laughs> Pretty girl, pretty, pretty girl. Cease to exist, just come and say you love me. Give up your work, come on, you can't be. I'm your kind, oh, your kind, and I can see Walk on, walk on, I love you, pretty girl My life is yours, and you can have my world Never had a lesson I ever learned but I know we all get our turn. I love you. Never learn not to love you. Submission is a gift. Go on, give it to your brother. Love and understanding is for one another. I'm your kind. I'm your kind. I'm your brother. I ever learned, but I know we all 
get our turn and I love you Never learn not to love you Never learn not to love you Never learn not to love you